Welcome, everyone. It's great to have you here for uh, the 2017 meeting of the Society for Scholarly Publishing uh, here in the greatest city in the world, Boston, Massachusetts. My name is Rick Anderson. I'm the president of the SSP this year. And uh, I'd like to begin uh, quickly by recognizing and thanking our sponsors, uh, to whom we owe so much of what happens at this meeting. Um, could anybody who is affiliated with one of the meeting sponsors please just stand quickly and uh, receive our appreciation? Thank you. I'd also like to invite the uh, annual meeting program committee co-chairs, Mary Beth Berea and Laura Ritchie to stand along with their deputy co-chair, Ben Mudrak. You have no idea. No idea how much work uh, they and their committee have, uh, have gone to over the past year uh, to prepare this outstanding program, and we appreciate it very, very much. And then uh, also I'd like to ask that our development committee co-chairs, Veronica Showers and Rebecca Shumbata, also stand and be recognized. This committee is the reason that we have so many of, uh, of our wonderful sponsors this year. So a couple of exciting announcements. One of them is that this year we have set an attendance record. I received word this afternoon that we had officially broken 1,000 attendees this year. I'd also like to send a shout out to those who are attending virtually. For the first time, we have offered the option of attending the conference from a distance uh, online. We have uh, somewhere north of 40 virtual attendees this year, and we want to make them feel welcome wherever they are. Um, I would now like to uh, show a, a really cool video that uh, introduces our new logo. Um, you all have seen, uh, have seen the new logo by now, I believe, um, but uh, we've prepared a, a really cool video to uh, introduce it officially, and I'll, let's go ahead and cue that up. I'll be saying just a little bit more about the brand refresh uh, project that we undertook this year uh, later on at the business meeting. So now just a few housekeeping items. I'm conscious of the fact that I'm the only thing standing between you and our outstanding keynote speaker today. Um, so I'm going to be brief. Please remember the code of conduct uh, for the meeting, which you'll find in the general information section of your program. Um, I'd also like to announce that this year we have uh, an unusual service. Uh, for those of you who may not have a professional headshot or who may need to update your professional headshot, um, we have uh, a headshot studio available to you during the meeting uh, this year. Um, what you need to do is just go down to the registration desk and sign up. Now, there's no formal charge for this service. 
However, we, rec we recommend a, a donation of at least $20, all of which will go to our fellowship program. And we're very grateful to Red Link Network for their sponsorship of the service, which is what makes that financial pass-through possible. Uh, for those of you who haven't figured this out already, Wi-Fi is available throughout the conference venue. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors for that. And um, also, uh, please do tweet uh, as we go throughout the program. Our Twitter hashtag for this year is, wait for it, hashtag SSP2017. So I'd now like to introduce Mary Beth Berea, who is going to introduce our opening keynote speaker. Mary Beth. Uh, thank you very much, Rick. Um, hi, everyone. On behalf of the Annual Meeting Program Committee, um, I'd also like to thank all of you for joining us here in Boston. It is truly an honor to be here this afternoon and to introduce our opening keynote speaker. This afternoon's speaker is Professor of Economics, Georgia State University, and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. She has also held a number of visiting positions around the world, including appointments at the Max Planck Institute and Harvard University. Much of our speaker's work has focused on a topic of great interest to those of us working in scholarly communications, uh, the challenges facing researchers in the sciences, particularly early career researchers. She currently serves on the National Academy's Committee on the Next Generation of Researchers Initiative. Science Careers also named our speaker their first person of the year in December of 2012. This award honors an individual who, during uh, the prior year, has made an especially significant and sustained contribution to the welfare of early career scientists. Uh, she has many interesting things to say about this topic, and I hope you'll join me now in giving a warm welcome to Paula Stepan. Thanks, Mary. Thanks very much, Mary Beth, for that kind introduction. And I want to thank SSP for inviting me to come and speak with you today. And I'm, I'm going to talk about changing research landscape implications for publishing. So if we can have the slides, I'll begin, OK? What I want to do in about the 40 to 45 minutes I'll talk is I want to focus on the market for PhDs, particularly early stage PhDs, and talk some about trends in employment, both in universities and in firms, the implications this has for publishing, and I'm going to conclude, if I have the time, by making some comments on risk aversion among scientists and funding organizations. So just to put this in some context here, we produce a lot of PhDs in the US. Um, in 2015, the year that the most recent data is available, we produced 12,500 PhDs in the life sciences, about 6,000 in physical and earth sciences, about 10,000 in engineering, 3,800 in math and computer science, and around 9,000 in psychology and social sciences together. Now, many, many new PhDs lack definite commitments at the time they get their degree. So this is data that the National Science Foundation collects through a survey called the Survey of Earned Doctorates. And this survey produces incredible look at PhDs because it has an astonishing response rate of between 94 and 96 percent. Now that's probably because on most campuses where this data is collected, the rumor is that you have to fill it out if you're going to graduate. Now that's not true, <laughs> but I think most campuses keep that rumor going so that they'll have a very high response rate. So don't think about this as having a sampling problem in it. Think about this as hard data, OK, about, what's, uh, about the plans. And so this is data for 1994 to 2014. 
The 2015 SED data will be out very soon. And this tells you the percent of new PhDs who have a definite commitment at the time they're graduating for either a job or a postdoctoral position, all right? And I think what you'll see is, particularly in the life sciences and engineering here, is this, is the cursor working? Can you see? Great, great, okay. That you'll see that it's been declining over time and that now in the biomedical life sciences, it's between 55 and 60%. It's a little lower in engineering and the physical sciences and social sciences are, slight, are higher, um, but um, the physical sciences have been declining recently. And <clears throat> you'll also obviously see a little bit of the effects of different recessions and booms in the data. You clearly see that when things were booming in the IT business, you know, at 2000, around 2000, that there was a pickup. We seem to have lost the slides. Okay, great. So I think it's important for you to realize that many, many of these people with definite commitments will go to postdoctoral training. That's where, particularly in the biomedical sciences, the definite commitment is. So this is more data from the survey of earned doctorates, and it shows you that, for example, in the life sciences, about 70% of all of these people with definite commitments are going to take a postdoctoral position. It's a little lower in the physical sciences um, and has dropped down to below 50% right now, but it's very, very close to 50%. I think it's very interesting to see what happened in engineering that didn't have a big tradition of postdocs until quite recently and when the recession hit and when jobs really were the crisis in 2008, 2009, we saw this huge uptick in postdocs going from 30% to 45% in new PhDs in engineering. And it's gone down some now, but not that much. And you'll notice a steady little nibbling up here of postdocs in non-SNE fields, and that the social sciences has doubled in the percent of people with definite commitments who are going into postdocs in recent years. So, the majority of people who are going into postdoc positions or who have postdocs have a strong preference for a research faculty position. So if you look at this data, this is data collected by Henry Sauerman and Mike Roach. Um, they started um, collecting data from 39 institutions for graduate students and postdocs at those institutions. They're all research institutions in the US and they're engineering and um, STEM fields. And they started collecting data in 2010 and they've just finished their third wave of a survey. And what's interesting about this data is they ask you when you're in graduate school if you expect to take a postdoc and they've also on other questions ask what your career goal is. So if you look at this data, you'll see the important ones to look at are is this column and this column. And so these are people in the biomedical life sciences who say that they plan to take a postdoc. Indeed, many of them are just leaving for a postdoc. And what is their strongest career preference? Well, it's in red, and that's a faculty research position. And you see very comparable data here in physics for people in the physics and you see comparable, even stronger data for people in computer science. The only field that we don't see that strong of effect in for people who are saying they're gonna take a postdoc with regard to research in a faculty position is in chemistry. It's not weak, it's just not that different from other sectors that they might want to go into, such as faculty teaching primarily or government or, or um, working for a firm. So, we have lots of people going into postdocs, and we have lots of people who are going into those postdocs because they want a faculty position, but it's important to realize that positions are scarce. Academe has become the alternative career. I mean, I used to, when I first started serving on National Academy committees, everybody talked about alternative careers, and those were going into industry or law or something like that. Well, academe has become the alternative career. 
Again, this is NSF data, but from a different survey. And what it's reporting is the percent of people who have graduated with a PhD three to five years before and um, telling you what percent of them are in a tenure or tenure track position. And red tells you what the data was. The most recent data they have from this survey is 2013. Red tells you the data for 2013. Blue is the data from 1993, 20 years earlier. So you see, in the biological sciences, 10.6% of these people who've been out three to five years are either in, are in a tenure track position. Um, and it had been higher, 17.3% 20 years earlier. In the physical sciences, it's 14.3%. Engineering, just about exactly the same at 14.6. Computer science and information, 13.8. But this is a huge change in the profession compared to what it had been 20 years before when over 50% of that cohort was in a tenure or tenure track position. That's when a lot of these departments were just growing. And in math, it's about 29%. Um, and it has been as high as 54% 20 years before. And of course, the competition is very strong for these tenure track positions. And that's because there are a lot of postdocs. It's not just that people take a postdoc at the time they get their PhD, but people tend to stay in a postdoc. And that's because of the few openings in academe. Now, counting postdocs is one of the most difficult things to do. <laughs> And we don't do a very good job at it, as, a, as a federal agencies don't do a great job at this. Um, it's tremendously undercounted, we know, and that's because on most campuses, people have a variety of titles who are in postdoc positions. So you have to think of these as lowball estimates. But giving these lowball estimates, NSF's most recent count in 2015 says that there are about 50,000, 48,000 people in postdoc positions who are in non-clinical fields. The biological sciences, 19,000 of them are there. Physical sciences, 7,300. And engineering, around 7,600. But it wasn't always like this. This is data I put together um, for a research project I was doing. And it looked at the percent of people in the biological sciences who were in a tenure track position or tenured five to six years after their PhD. And look at, in 1973, it was 55%, OK? And we've seen the steady decline over time. And one reason I point this out to you is that you've got to remember that a lot, there's still a lot of faculty around who got their PhD around in this period, OK? And they remember a whole different experience. When they got their degree, at least half of their cohort ended up in academe. And so they have a very different, I think, mentality in terms of thinking about what job outcomes are and what training is. And that's one thing we often hear from um, new cohorts of PhDs. So let's talk about the role of publications. Publications, especially first authored articles in high impact journals, are a necessary condition for getting out of what you might think of, or a necessary condition for getting out of postdoc jail into an academic position, OK? And why do I call it jail? I mean, because people who are doing postdocs, almost everybody in this kind of position, went into science because they really like puzzle solving. They really like working on problems. They're very committed to it. Yet they end up in a position with extraordinarily low pay. So this is NSF's data. And these are just medians. And I assure you, their tails really very much to the lower end. We know some postdocs at some institutions are getting about 25000 a year. And we know some postdocs, particularly in high in places where the cost of living is quite high, are earning significantly above this median. But anyhow, you see the red bar is what postdocs are getting as soon as they leave graduate school. In the, and this is 2014 data. 
In the life sciences, it was 40,000. And by the way, the blue bar tells you what, if you went into a teaching position, and that's what most of these are if you go right out of graduate school, you would be making. And the green is if you got a job in industry. So you see, for all of these, the postdoc salaries are quite low relative to the other salaries. And the physical sciences pay more, primarily because a lot of the postdocs are at federal labs. And federal labs pay more for postdoctoral training. It's not just the low pay that makes you think that, um, why I use the jail <laughs> analogy. It's postdocs work very, very long hours. One NSF survey of all the respondents who were postdocs, the average that they reported working is 2,650 hours a year um, in the biomedical and physical sciences, a little less in engineering and just a little less in psychology, but these are very long hours. And until quite recently, many, many postdocs were on campuses where they were not considered employees in the terms of the kinds of benefits. So they didn't have many fringe benefits, and they didn't have things like um, health leave or maternity leave, et cetera. So if you're in a position like this and you want an academic job, it's absolutely crucial to publish and particularly have a first authored article. Um, Mike Lauer, who's the deputy director of, of extramural research at NIH, likes to refer to this as the arms race component of the postdoc. I mean, we have all these postdocs trying to get these positions, working very, very hard to be a first author in a key publication, particularly in a very high impact journal, because people pay attention, as you know, to impact. And it turns out, of course, that the lucky few, and I think sometimes we were talking about this before this started, it's not always clear that they're that lucky, but the few who get these jobs are not that young by the time they get them. So again, this is NSF data um, and NIH data, and what it shows is the blue line is the average age at the time you get a PhD, which is around 31. This goes on from 1980 through 2008. Um, <clears throat> and then the red line is the average age at first tenure track position, and you see that it's been between 37 and 39. Um, it, I think it has some measurement error at the very end of that calculation. And then the blue line is the average age when you get your first R01 grant, which is the bread and butter for people in the biomedical sciences from NIH, and it's gone up to be um, higher than 41 years now. So. I mean, you are not exactly um, a young, a really young person at the time you get these positions. And of course, if you look at the stat, you realize that the majority of new PhDs are going to go and work in industry. Government hires very, very few PhDs. So the majority will work in industry. And it turns out that quite a few of the people who go to work in industry will work in firms that do not do R&D at all, and that's somewhat relevant for you because it's primarily R&D firms. There have been firms that have a history of publishing and publishing in very top journals, and these non-R&D firms are not publishing. So just to give you a taste of that, um, there is a data project now called the Umetrics Data Project. Umetrics is a project that was begun by Julia Lane and some others, and is now situated at the University of Michigan. And this data, what it does is universities sign up to be part of it, and, it, and you put your administrative records from all grants that have come in into it. You can then scrape these grants for the names of people supported on the grants. We can identify who are PhD students at the time they were supported. We can then take that data to the US Census and under very, very careful security arrangements, we can match it to records and we can know what you're doing after you graduate. So we did this as kind of a proof of concept for eight Midwestern universities that agreed to be work with us on this. Um, our results were published in 
an issue of Science in December of 2016. Nick Zolas at Census was the lead author. So what did we find for these people who had been supported on grants, which is the majority of PhD students in STEM fields, what were they doing? And this is across fields. Well, 50% of them were in academe, and when we pulled up their earnings, I'd say that 90% of that 50% were in postdoc positions because the earnings were very low, around $40,000 to $45,000. Um, <clears throat> 20.8% of them were in R&D firms. They were working in firms that are classified as research and development firms, but 21.6% of them were in non-R&D firms. And a, a small percent of them were in government. Ooh, I went backwards. OK. And another way of looking at this is this is data that was put together for the workforce report. NIH had a workforce commission in 2012 um, that a number of us participated in. The co-chair was Shirley Tillman, who was president of Princeton at that time, and Sally Rocky from NIH. And this database was put together showing what different cohorts of PhDs in the biomedical sciences were doing in terms of their career placement for people who had been out one to five years, six to 10 years, that's this group here, 11 to 20, and over 20. So what this graph does is it shows you, in 1993, people who had been out one to five years, what sector they were in. And we go forward here, it, it shows you, and it, and it follows them from 93, or it, it looks at what people in that cohort were doing in 93 through 2008. And then you can do the same thing for people who've been out six to 10 years and people who've been out 11 to 20, et cetera. So there are three colors, I think, to look at here. Red is the percent of that cohort for year, for each of these years, that was in a tenure track position. Purple is the percent that are doing research outside of academe, and that's really an industry. And green is the percent that are working in non-research, non-academic positions, and those are primarily in industry. And if you just look at this cohort that's been out six to 10 years, we see this significant increase in the percent of people that are doing non-research in non-academic positions. And we see that it just about equals the percent that are doing research at what are really R&D firms. So what are the implications of this for publishing? Well, as you see, many of these industrial placements are not in R&D firms. Half of those that we found in new metric study are not, and half of the placements, as I just showed you, in this um, NIH workforce study are not. And it turns out that even scientists working in R&D firms are now less likely to publish. I really encourage you to go to the NBER website and download a paper called Killing the Golden Goose, The Decline of Science in Corporate R&D that's written by Ashish Aurora and colleagues. And one of the things they document very, very clearly in this is that the number of R&D firms in the United States that are publishing has declined dramatically. So I'm just gonna show you three data points here. If you see in 1980, this is the first data point here, 30% of R&D firms were publishing that year. And if you go forward to 1992, it's 15%. And now it's around 2000, in 2007, it was around 11%. So there's been a major decline in firms doing research that they wish to publish. I think. Um, this is not really the scope of this talk, but the drivers behind that are, as we all know, there's been a major decline of large basic research intensive labs. I mean, the two that come to mind, but there were others, are DuPont and Bell Labs. Many firms have switched from doing basic research to doing, from doing basic and applied research to just doing applied research, which is much less likely to be published. 
And firms have really narrowed the focus of what they're working on. And the research seems to show that the broader the scope of what a firm was working on, the more likely it was to do basic research and to publish. And that's because, in some sense, there are spillovers from one area in a firm to another area. But if you have just this very narrow area, it um, tends to, not, to, to make basic research become less important. And of course, we've all read that outsourcing is a part. And I'm not just talking about abroad. I'm talking about um, doing with people on campuses or with small firms or with people in just um, other um, places that have done some research. So despite the trends I've shown you here, the US is educating and training more and more PhDs. So this is data that I put together from going back to 1920 to administrative records um, at the National Science Foundation, going forward to actually 2012. And it shows you the growth of PhDs in the United States over time. And you can also clearly see recessions and other things that cause these dips. But the two fields that are at the top here are engineering and the life sciences. And you see that except for these recession dips that were quite strong, there's been a huge growth in the number of PhDs awarded in the US. So why? Why are we in a situation like this where we are training lots of PhDs, but yet there's strong indication that the demand for PhDs doing research is not as large as the number of people we're training? Well, I would say that it's in part because US universities operate like a high-end shopping mall, OK? What do I mean like that? Well, universities are in the business of building state-of-the-art facilities and reputation that attracts good students, good faculty, and resources. And then they turn around and lease the facilities to faculty in the form of indirect costs on grants and the buyout of salary. And faculty, in order to get their space going in the mall, receive startup funds when hired. And you know these startup funds can be quite large. I just talked to a young, um, a young, a young um, postdoc who was just leaving for her first tenure track position, and her startup package was $900,000. And I know very senior people whose startup package has been as high as $5 million. So universities are investing a considerable amount in helping people get their space ready or their research program got ready. Now, many faculty pay for the opportunity of working at the university, receiving no guarantee of income if they fail to bring in grants. So this shopping mall model means that funding is all important for principal investigators. And it's particularly important if you're on a contract that says that you have no salary guarantee um, if you don't have funding behind you. And you'd be surprised at the majority of US medical schools, even tenured faculty, um, do not have a salary guarantee. It does not come with their tenure. So as Stephen Quake, a biophysicist at Stanford, says, many people on university campuses are in a position of funding or perish. So faculty have to spend a considerable amount of time writing and administrating grants. And they do this in an environment that's become increasingly competitive. These are NIH and NSF success rates I put together over a long period of time. And the red is NSF. The blue is NIH. And ex except for ARA and the way NSF administered the ARA funds, success rates have been declining pretty much over time. And so getting funds is highly competitive. Now, this focus on grant, on the importance of grants raises the importance of having other people to work in your lab. Because the principal investigator, the person who's running the lab, a large, large part of their time is diverted to grant administration and writing grant proposals. One estimate is that a principal investigator spends 42% of their time on grant administration. And the importance of funding raises, of course, the importance of publications, given the key role that publications and their associated bibliometrics play in grant review and grant success. 
So the response of principal investigators, and this is not a new response, this has been going on for quite a bit of time, is to staff their labs with people to do the research for the proposals that they've gotten successfully funded. They staff their labs with postdocs and graduate students. There are very good reasons from their point of view to do this. They're young, they're full of ideas, they're temporary. As one principal investigator said to me, if it doesn't work, I can fire them, all right? Um, and they're cheap. And as an economist, I pay particular attention to the fact that they're cheap. A postdoc costs about $16.50 an hour. A graduate student, it's, it depends on the system as to the cost of tuition and how that's worked into it, but around $20. And a staff scientist, at a minimum, would cost about $32. So the, the incentive here is to hire the postdoc or the graduate student. So I think it's no surprise, and I'm sure you all know this, that graduate students and postdocs play a very key role in publishing. So this is data that we assembled from the journal Science, and what we did is for um, a year of publications in Science, we took all articles that were written in a US university lab, and we studied articles that had 10 or fewer authors, and we did research to figure out what they were, whether they were a faculty member, a staff, a scientist, um, someone at another university, whether they were a postdoc, a graduate student, et cetera. And so from my point of view, these are all articles, not first authored. These are all authors, not first authored articles, authors. And you see that 22% were postdocs, 20% graduate students. There are another 4%. We couldn't quite tell whether they were what kind of student they were. But that means that 46% that are students or postdocs, and 54% are in faculty positions or um, at core facilities, et cetera. But when it comes to first author, okay, and we looked at the first author of these articles, we found that 74% of them were either postdocs or graduate students. 42% were postdocs. 30% were graduate students, and 2% were, we weren't sure whether they were a postdoc or a graduate student. It's also important to realize, I think, that there's been a lot of copycat behavior here. If the shopping model, mall model works for science and engineering, why not for the social sciences and humanities? So there's a great deal of pressure on campuses to bring in grants in these fields. And I think you need to realize that these are fields that have not had historically large federal funding available for them, and not a lot of private funding in them. And in these fields, we also see hiring more temporary staff and increasing the number of postdocs. I already showed you that postdocs are growing in these fields. And there's copycat behavior abroad, for sure. Um, funding has become increasingly important in many countries, funding going directly to the faculty member that the faculty member proposes. Um, I work in Belgium, I work in France, you see it there, you see it in Italy, you see it definitely in the UK. And publications play a major role in the evaluation process for the kind of funding that these people are um, uh, are eligible for. And publications play a major role in exiting a postdoc position. I have just been in Portugal. I just came back from an OECD um, team that we were evaluating higher education in Portugal. And we looked at data on postdocs. There are a lot of postdocs in Portugal. And when you talk to them, one of their major concerns is that the only way they're going to get out of their postdoc is to have a top first authored publication in a high impact journal. So it's not just in the US that we see this kind of pressure. So this shopping mall model, I think, has some perverse incentives in it. I've already talked about one of them. And in closing, let me just talk very briefly about risk aversion. And I think that this is another perverse incentive of this system. 
So there is a lot of concern that scientists avoid risk by submitting proposals they see as sure bets. So why? Well, in order to keep your lab's funding going or functional, you have to have extramural report, support. The startup funds I talked about will run out in three to four years. And the need for faculty to obtain grants, of course, is much more, um, is, is much more pressure if you're in a contract that is not backed up by salary. And NIH estimates that 35% of all the salary of, of all investigators that are supported are in soft money positions by NIH. So that means if you don't have a grant, you're just not going to be paid. I've already shown you there's a low probability of success at funding agencies. And then there is a real preference on the part of reviewers for having very, very convincing evidence, very convincing preliminary data that what you propose to do, you can definitely do. Um, I was on NIGMS council at NIH for four years, and at that time we were funding protein structure initiatives, and the saying there was no crystal, no grant. If you didn't already have a crystal of the protein, you weren't going to get a grant. Or Roger Kornberg, the Nobel laureate, says if the work that you propose to do isn't virtually certain of success, then it won't be funded. There are clearly other factors that contribute to this. Our grant system has tended to be very short term, from three to five years. And it's project oriented, not person oriented primarily. And this means that if a project fails in three to five years, it's very, very hard to recoup. But if you can't recoup, it's very unlikely you'll get funding in the future. And then there's also this perverse incentive, I think, of the ability explicitly at NIH, implicitly at NSF, to be able to continue a line of research. I have sat on NIGMS Council when I've seen proposals that are in their 44th year of funding. Okay, This means a researcher has been working in the same broad area for 44 years. It doesn't exactly encourage switching or branching out tremendously. So I would argue that as a society, there are very high costs to risk aversion. It's pretty clear that if most scientists are risk averse, there's little chance that transformative research is going to occur, leading to significant returns from investments in research and development. Incremental research definitely yields results, and we, don't, and we want lots of people to do it. But in order to realize substantial gains, we need more people doing transformative research. And there have been some scientists who've written very, very um, interesting pieces about this. I would encourage you sometime to pull up a piece by Greg Petsko. Greg used to be at Brandeis. He was at MIT before that. And now he's at Weill Cornell Medical School. And he wrote this piece in Gen Genome Biology, exploring reasons why Columbus's proposal, finding a new route to the Indies by sailing west, is hypothetically rejected. And it, it's, it's, quite, um, it's quite apropos. And then an article that got a great deal of attention from people in the policy community and in people in the biomedical community was published in PNAS. Um, about three years ago. It was called Rescuing U.S. Biomedical Research from Its Systemic, Fault, from its systemic Fault Flaws. And it had a stellar cast of authors. Among them, we have Shirley Tillman, who had just stepped down as president of Princeton at that time, a geneticist, Bruce Alberts, the former editor of Science, um, Harold Varmus, a Nobel laureate, the director of NIH for a while and a National Cancer Institute, and Mark Kirshner, a systems biologist here at Harvard. And they outline a number of problems in the biomedical sciences, but risk aversion is definitely one of them. One can make the strong argument, I think, that bibliometrics reinforce risk aversion. The heavy reliance on short-term bibliometric measures arguably reinforces risk aversion when it comes to funding individuals as well as promoting people. 
So I've been doing research on this with two colleagues in Belgium, um, Reinhild de Vuliger and Jean Wang. And um, our research has yet to be published in a scholarly journal, but Nature, a comment that we wrote was published in Nature about this research five weeks ago under the title, Blinkered by Bibliometrics. And what we do there is explore um, how, what, who? Can I get back to my first, to the end? I've, can you get me back to the end of my slide presentation? Well, something has moved it. Sorry. I think that the, this, this, cur this cursor gets in the way. Okay. That's the problem. Where do you want to get to? Oh, I want to go about. Oh, here. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. I'm sorry about that. Okay. So, the premise of our research is that novel research that combines streams of knowledge that have never been combined before is inherently much more risky than research that is combining things that other people have combined before. And that it's, in the sense that it's more risky, it's more likely to fail, but it's also more likely to have the possibility of pushing the frontier forward. And how do you operationalize that kind of research? How do you find novel research? Well, in the work we did, we operationalized it by looking at the number of first ever journal pairs in references of papers that were published in 2001, and then we follow them forward to 2016 and look at what happens to their citations. So first we find that papers that do this are very rare, 11% of papers do it, but that most of those only make one combination and if you look at papers that make multiple combinations, that's very rare. It's less than 1%. And when you look at papers that make these novel combinations, what we find is that they are not initially appreciated in terms of citations. So this is the probability on this axis that you'll be in the top 1% of published papers. The blue here are highly novel papers. The um, gray is non-novel papers. The red is slightly novel. And what you see is that citations are much lower, or the probability of being one of these top 1% cited papers is much lower for the highly novel papers in the first couple of years. And they only begin to shine, so to speak, as time um, goes on. And by 15 years, they're much more likely than the non-novel papers. And the moderately novel papers are only um, minimally um, different than those. And then we also looked at what kind of impact factor journals they're published in. And we control for all kinds of characteristics of the journal, which I'm sure you all know much more about than I do. But if you take all of those into consideration, and then you, you estimate the impact of the journal in which they're published, you'll find that the, that the highly novel papers are published in journals that have a much lower impact. We see that with these, um, the blue line here compared to the red line, which are the, the non-novel. So the implications here are that a heavy reliance on short-term bibliometric measures, such as, such as two-year impact factors, and just looking at somebody's very, very recent citations, biases funding decisions against investigators doing novel research. And I think that's a concern, because we tend to think this research is risky, but if it pays off, it can have a much higher probability of producing strong results. And yet, with this kind of bias, we find that many, many funding agencies either explicitly or implicitly rely on bibliometrics. So explicitly, you will find a number of funding organizations, particularly in Europe, that tell applicants that they have to include bibliometric measures as part of their application. 
They have to list the impact factor of all the journals they published in, and they have to list their number of citations. And that's not just for Europe, it's other places. But then you also have places like the European Research Council that distinctly says you can't do it, but yet people, when they're writing their grants, put it in, and reviewers, just like reviewers in the United States, come to review having downloaded people's citations, having paid a lot of attention to citations. They're so available, like with Google Scholar, they're so tempting when you have a stack of papers, of proposals to review. And there, these are implicitly, I think, um, biasing the kind of decisions that they're made. So, in closing, let me just try to summarize what I've talked about, okay? I've talked about the fact that the supply of PhDs is growing and greater than the demand for research positions. And although this is field specific, it's true of many fields in the biomedical sciences, and it's definitely been true of some fields in the humanities. And this is whether these positions are in academe or in industry. And I've tried to talk some about the implications for publishing. Postdocs are under tremendous pressure to publish, just tremendous pressure. And faculty are under pressure to publish not only for tenure, but to retain their place in the mall. They're going to have to have funding, and funding will depend critically upon their publication record. I think incentives that have been built into bibliometrics and the use of short-term bibliometrics and many, many of the bibliometrics used at funding agencies and in promotions on campus are short-term. They discourage risk-taking in the type of research that is funded and carried out. An industry which is hiring um, a larger and larger percent of PhDs than it did in the past is publishing less and a lot of those PhDs are going to non-R&D firms. So what's the outlook for academe? Well, I think it's very unlikely that public funds for, for research will grow substantially, and in some fields they'll decline, and I'm sure Jeff Mervis is going to tell you a lot of news about that tomorrow. And as you know, the administration has proposed or is toying with the idea of cutting indirect rates, which would be a big hit for universities. And universities, especially public universities, are being particularly squeezed by a loss of funds from states. Um, as one president of a Midwestern institution said to me, I think we've run out of any more miracles for raising you know, money. We've already played our cards in raising tuition for out of state and for foreign students, and we really can't get much more revenue that way. There has been some growth in funding from private foundations, but I think it's important to realize that almost all that growth is for very um, focused, applied research or very directed research. Most of it is very cure-oriented. Hmm. This is not. So, I think I'll close by saying, can the shopping mall model survive? I think there are serious cracks in the model. But of course, it's not just universities that are having problems. Many of you probably saw the headline in the New York Times about six weeks ago that said, is America retail at a historic tipping point? And it all focused on the problems of large malls in cities. So I think we need to ask a similar question. Is academe reaching a tipping point? And I'll end here. I'll be happy to take questions, or if you don't have a chance to ask a question, this is my email, and I'll be glad to respond to email. And if you'd like to learn more about some of these things I've talked about, I talk about some of them in my book, How Economics Shapes Science. I've talked about some of them in a comment that was in Nature a few years ago. And um, the NBER celebrated the 75th anniversary Oh, or the 70th anniversary of The Endless Frontier, the report by Vannevar Bush. And we published a book um, on it called The Changing Frontier. And I have a chapter in there called The Endless Frontier, being what Bush sowed. And of course, that's Vannevar Bush, not the other Bush. <laughs> OK, so I'll stop here. And I'll be happy to take questions. I think we have
have a question from one of our virtual attendees. Oh, great. Um, yeah, we do. We have a question from Toshi, who's watching from Tokyo. So it's uh, pretty early in the morning. Pretty there. virtual. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So he was just asking you. You had mentioned uh, your story about the postdocs in Portugal. I'm just curious whether uh, the other trends you've noted about PhD production and less publishing in industry are true around the world as well. Well, it's definitely the trend I know about for publishing in industry is primarily in Europe, and I can't answer this for Japan or Korea. I don't think I've seen data there, and there has been a history of doing university uh, industry research in Japan. Um, but it's definitely true. Well, first of all, you need to know that most European countries have hired very few PhDs. They seem to be PhD shy. And this is a big problem for PhDs getting positions in Europe when academe is not hiring. Um, so I, I haven't looked at the publishing trends, but I can, I've looked at the hiring of PhD trends, OK? So I'm afraid I can't address your I don't have data to specifically address your question. The person I, John Walsh, a colleague of mine who's at Georgia Tech, um, is, does a lot of work in Japan, and I'll be happy to put you in contact with him, and I think he could answer your question for that. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the presentation function from ACS. So I just recently came back from China, and I'm sure you have learned and, and have reported elsewhere in China with the finding the economic, economy and, and the publishing output, um, the impact factor, I think, the, the impact of those on research is extremely, extremely <laughs> biased. And so actually you have people in China looking up to us and, and to see are there any best practice we could share with them so that the research is not geared towards you know, the short-term gain, but more original. And, and when talking to people, my question is, it seems to be everyone thinks the situation should be improved. But they, they, I'm sorry, they think what should be improved? They want to change the culture of the research there. But then you go around, you have the university, you have the funding agency, and you have the publisher, and you have the researcher themselves. Like, it seems to be in a comfort orbit, orbit, orbit soon. Like, who is going to take the leap off that? So where do you see that can break that cycle? Well, I think it's, it's very hard, and, and I mean, I, I don't know if it's still going on in China, but just as recently as a couple of years ago, China was paying very large bonuses to people who published in very high-impact journals. And actually, with two Italian researchers that I've been working with, we had a piece in Science that looked at what submissions to science happen country by country when these incentives were changed, and boy, when China started paying bonuses, you know, submissions to science went up just incredibly. And of course, China's not the only country that's done that. Korea does that, and there are other countries that do that. And I understand the temptation for doing that, but I think it, it I really think it's a perverse incentive, okay? And it makes people chase those kinds of publications, and it created a huge, I don't, this is not quite the right way to say this, but an excess of submissions in some way because it's almost like playing the lottery. You know, you'll send it off to see if you'll get it. And I think that the US, and well, Australia's been very bad at this. Australia, for promotion, for giving funds to universities, for a long time, they just counted articles. They didn't look at the quality. So that's another kind of perverse incentive. So I think any time we start building these kinds of counting or rewarding into the system, we tend to get um, not exactly desirable um, out, you know, um, outcomes. On the other hand, I've been very struck by how China's encouragement to publish 
has made Chinese scientists look for co-authors outside of China. And I think um, I have a very close colleague in France, an economist, and her husband is a very well-known physicist. And every week he gets an inquiry from somebody in China who would like to write an article with him. I mean, David Carré has published in, in Nature and Science and many, and, he's, and he visits China a lot. But it turns out that some of these collaborations have turned out to be really good collaborations, all right? So I think that those kinds of incentives are good. I think the, the difficulty here is that it's very easy to emulate what other countries have done and to get all the bad that's come from our system and not get some of the good. And one of the things I think we all believe is that the best way to judge whether somebody's doing research is to sit down and read it and, and um, talk with them about it and that putting all this emphasis on just counting can end up with some problems. Um, hello, um, Isabel Thompson, Oxford University Press. Um, so I was wondering, um, you hinted at the end about um, private foundations, I guess things like the CZI and things like that, that are put, put three billion into um, uh, curing all disease by the end of the 21st century. Can you, maybe there's, very, there's feedback or something, it's hard for me to hear you. Probably, I'm speaking too quickly. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, so you mentioned private foundations, um, I guess like with CZI. Um, I was wondering, first of all, why do you think we've, or the academic ESO ecosystem has allowed itself to get into a position where it's harboring so much frustration that other um, uh, non-traditional funders are entering uh, the market trying to force the issue? That's one question. Um, and the second question is, how would you like to see the funding system restructured so as to avoid... Uh, perpetuating some of these issues that you talked about? Well, let me first talk about private foundations. I think that there's some encouraging news about private foundations. I think that there is um, the Society for um, Science, Science Philanthropy, I think that's its name. Some of you may know it. It's a West Coast foundation that has been um, started about eight years ago, I believe. It's really working with donors. Most of these are very, very wealthy people um, who want to start a foundation, and it's trying to help them find their space as to what to fund. And I think that's very helpful because in many of these, there's more of a movement towards some basic science and to some areas that are not all in the biomedical sciences. I don't have anything against the biomedical sciences, but I think there's a great deal of work that needs to be done in other areas and that it hasn't been as obvious, okay? And for example, this organization worked very hard to set up the with, with the Chung at Zuckerberg, setting that up. And I think um, we have an MBER meeting in which these kind of funders are coming to talk with us to talk about the kinds of data and information they might like to have to know whether they're making an impact and whether how they're moving forward. And so I think there's some positive things going on in that space. I do think that universities being so pinched for money have put a lot of emphasis, particularly in getting funds from grateful patients. You may be aware of this, but there's a huge move in medical schools, medical uh, in clinics and in hospitals to attach a development officer to a doctor and to help the doctor identify grateful patients who may be willing to make, no, I'm serious. I mean, you should read the articles about this, who may be willing to step forward. And these are almost always gifts to do research in biomedical research and pretty applied, okay? But I think if we can broaden, Warren Buffett, you know, has gotten a lot of billionaires to sign a pledge. And I think that if this pledge money goes into broader and some very basic science, and that's what many people are working with, some of these very, very wealthy people, we may be able to change some of the funding 
available and more of the funding culture. Now, in terms of the way we fund, I have, I think the research suggests to me that it's much better to fund people and not projects. And I also think we really need to fund people, to fund people for a reasonable period of time. Just trying to get a new grant every three years is just a rat race in a sense. And if you have a longer period of time, you can have a longer horizon. And I think that's very, very helpful for planning. But the incentives, you have to remember that there are these strong incentives out there to bring in money, okay, and to have a high reputation. And universities work very hard at that. And for most universities, the thing they want more than anything is membership in the AAU. And one of the biggest criteria for membership in the AAU is how much funding you bring in. From not all federal organizations, remember agriculture doesn't count as much as I believe it was the University of Nebraska found when it left the AAU recently. It's funding from NIH and NSF that really counts. And so we also have to think about changing those incentives, I think. I think that's going to have okay. to be our last question. Good. Dr. Stephan, thank you so thank you. much. You, you know that feeling that you get when you come out of a really, really good horror movie? <laughs> that, I was trying to identify the feeling I was having at the end of Dr. Stefan's presentation, and that was it. Um, so thanks again to Dr. Stefan for that outstanding keynote presentation. We would now like to invite everyone to uh, come participate in the speed networking program, uh, which will be followed by the opening reception at 6.30 in the Carlton, Burroughs, and Lewis rooms. Again, welcome to SSP 2017, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you.